Right. So, admit. So this is our festive December episode of Odd Sex. And I'd like to take this end of the calendar year time to thank all of our 2022 speakers and all of our attendees, both live and those who catch up or review on YouTube. If you missed any of our um, uh, seminars past, uh, which included Melissa Maori, Christina Huang, Ross Carroll, Dustin Stewart, Rebecca Mitstein, and Christy Pichichero, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. I also like to urge you to follow us on Eventbrite, and I'm just popping the link here in the chat. Do two things at once. Uh, and or to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, to look at uh, where you can look out, where you can watch our, our seminars past and also look out for announcements of our ma amazing ghosts of or slate to speakers for 2023. Uh, so enough about our seminars past and seminars future. I'd like to talk about our seminar present. Today's talk is one that is very, very dear to my heart. In the interests of transparency and humble bragging, I should admit slash boast that I was fortunate enough to be part of this amazing collection and to uh, have been privileged to watch it come together over several plague interrupted years. I invited Steffi and Nora to speak to Odd Sex because I think this book speaks to our core values expanding the boundaries of 18th century studies and making it a more inclusive space for a broader range of scholarship, for really challenging us to think about what we mean by contemporary scholarship. I love this book for, for many, many reasons, but largely because it speaks to and with a much broader range of scholars, including artists and writers, fans and practitioners of many kinds. I love it for the very expansive understanding of scholarship it makes possible. And um, I love it for bringing all these voices together in one place under a very, very attractive cover. Uh, so without any further preamble, because I really want our amazing co-editors to have the full hour to talk about the process of this book and the experience of it, I would like to pass over to Nora and Steffi, who will introduce each other. Uh, Thanks so much. Um, okay, first of all, um, thank you so much for having you, us. Good morning, and I'm so thrilled to see everybody here, um, including several of our contributors, which um, I hope you guys will chime in during the discussion. Um, okay, Steffi, take it away. Okay. Nora Nishumi is Associate Professor of English and Coordinator of the Minor in Women's Studies at Stern College for Women, Yeshiva University. She is the author of Acting Like a Lady, British Women Novelists and the 18th Century Stage, and has published essays and book chapters on female novelists, playwrights, pedagogy, and film, including two recent essays on Austin and Adaptation, co-authored with me. She is also co-editor of Making Stars, Biography and Celebrity in 18th Century Britain, and Jane Austen's Sex and Romance, Engaging with Desire in the Novels and Beyond with Christina Straub and with me, respectively. Okay, and at the risk of sounding slightly repetitive, Stephanie Oppenheim is Associate Professor of English at Borough of Manhattan Community College of the City University of New York. She has published articles on Jane Austen, Pedagogy and Gender, she is the co-author, sorry, co-editor with me of Jane Austen's Sex and Romance, Engaging with Desire in the Novels and Beyond. Other recent work with me includes Was It Good for You, Sex, Love in Austen, and Lady Susan and Love and Friendship, Laughter, Satire, and the Impact of Form. Thank you for inviting us to speak with you today about the genesis of Jane Austen's Sex and Romance, Engaging with Desire in the Novels and Beyond. Our plan is to keep this talk light, bright, and sparkling, 
light bright and sparkling as Austin would say. We will be sharing with you the history of our transformation into Austin Sexperts, which is how we were courted by a journalist from an online men's magazine who was writing an article about Bridgerton as an aphrodisiac. At the same time, we will be making a pitch for our book as a serious scholarly endeavor, one that intentionally blurs the boundaries between academia and popular culture. It does so by incorporating voices from diverse backgrounds, including journalism, screenwriting, digital media, fiction writing, and Austin fandom. While excellent work on Austin and popular culture already exists, our approach differs in many ways from traditional work in this field. Very little academic work on Austin and popular culture includes voices outside of the ivory tower. At the time we began this project, no one had done it. By the time our book was finally coming together, What's Next for Jane Austen, a special edition of Texas Studies in Literature and Language, edited by Janine Barkas and Devaney Lozer, had paved the way. We should also mention that a few non-academic publications incorporate the voices of academics, but the makeup of those collections is heavily weighted the other way. None of these collections, however, focus on Austen, sex, and romance. In fact, not much work has been done in this area. Granted, as Devaney Lozer points out in her essay for our collection, there has always been a cohort of readers and writers who embrace Austen's erotic potential. Historically, however, Austen scholars, as well as her more traditional fans, have resisted the idea of an unchaste Austen. As Terry Castle and Eve Sedgwick discovered in the 1990s, to write about Austen and sex is to provoke the ire of such readers. Perhaps this is why in the last 20 years, only one academic book, Jill Height Stevenson's Unbecoming Conjunctions, has directly addressed Austin and sex. We suspect that this particular void has to do with the, different, the ways different communities of readers and writers have historically talked about Austin and have envisioned themselves in relation to her work. General readers and moviegoers talk about Austin's characters not only as if they were real people, but freely consider them as objects of desire, especially since the 1995 BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, it may have seemed, at least to some scholars, that Austen's novels have become synonymous with sex and romance in the popular imagination. For us to dwell on the erotic heat in the novels and the films consequently threatens to destabilize traditional divisions between scholars and the general public. Acknowledging the erotic energy in the novels requires that we grapple with questions traditionally avoided by academics, like how Austen's novels generate physical and emotional responses in their readers. It may also involve abandoning an authority buttressed by the assumption that we are objective and emotionally detached from our material. The topic, in short, raises the possibility that we may not be better interpreters of Austen than readers outside the academy including those who regard themselves as her most ardent fans. Yet if Austen's popular appeal springs largely from her ability to convey her character's romantic and sexual desires and to tap into those of her readers, an understanding of this dimension of her work is crucial to appreciating not only the novels, but the countless works of fiction, film, and other media that it has generated in our time. We believe that it is no longer possible to isolate Austen's novels from the broader cultural contexts in which they circulate. To do so is to ignore the dynamic relationship between Austen's work and the majority of her readers, to separate a static idea of Austen from re what readers do with Austen. These readers include our students, whose interest in the novels is mediated by adaptations and spin-offs, which frequently highlight erotic desire. We encounter this larger audience in classrooms, at conferences, in movie theaters, and online. Our book emerged from the conviction that we need to let go of our oppositional relationships in order to see what we can learn from one another. To do this requires confronting the conflicting ways we talk or avoid talking about sex and romance in Austin. For this reason, Jane Austen's Sex and Romance zeroes in not just on the erotics of Austen's novels and their adaptations, but on the discourse that surrounds this divisive topic. Our obsession with Austen and sex began in the 1990s when we were in graduate school. 
For me, it began when a fellow student in Rachel Brownstein's Austin seminar mistook the query, was Jane Austen a romantic author as a question about Regency romances rather than about literary periodization. The quiet scorn, this is not a flattering story. The quiet scorn that that poor student endured from the rest of us made me feel guilty. I was uneasy, not only because I could easily have made the same mistake, but because she wasn't necessarily wrong. I reached my boiling point when an intelligent friend who loved the Austin movies gushed over how romantic Austin was. Meanwhile, another friend who hated the movies disparaged Austin for the same reasons. When he claimed to have actually read Pride and Prejudice in college, I muttered under my breath, not very well. We shared our scholarly distress over a bottle of wine. As the bottle got emptier, our guards lowered. We admitted the truth. We were hypocrites. Granted, we didn't understand Edmund's allure or even Knightley's, but weren't we also slightly turned on by the verbal jousts between Elizabeth and Darcy? Didn't Wentworth's letter to Anne raise our pulses just a wee bit? Eventually, I devolved my lifelong crush on Frank Churchill. After Nora stopped laughing, she confessed to watching Colin Firth's Darcy jump into the lake more than once. The wine and the guilt made us cocky. To make amends for our hypocrisy, we would write a book. Once we sobered up, however, we realized that the specter of two graduate students arguing that everything at Austin was hot was a limited and highly subjective endeavor. Time passed. A few years later, after graduate school was over and tenure secured, we began to consider the project for real. Erotic Austin was everywhere, in movie theaters, online, in the classroom. Meanwhile, the relationship between academic and non-academic readers had started to change. Early scholars of fan studies sought to overturn the image of fans lacking in critical judgment and to emphasize their thoughtfulness, creativity, and sense of play. While some assumed a detachment from the fan communities they studied, others began to acknowledge that fan and scholarly identities might overlap. In 2011, in Everybody's Jane, Juliet Wells addressed the uneasiness of the academic with the amateur's display of feeling when she asked, if you were a literary scholar, would you answer or avoid a question about what Jane Austen means to you? You might answer such a question, but only off the record, lest your colleagues hear you speaking in a way that seems unprofessional. Wells urged all of us, amateur and scholar alike, to let down our guard and take the opportunity to come together and share what we love and have learned about this exceptional author. By the second decade of the 21st century, Austin scholars had begun to respond to Wells's call in diverse and fruitful ways. As we returned to our project, others were breaking new ground in exposing academic readers to fan perspectives. Meanwhile, non-academics became more open to scholarly approaches to Austin. Communities that once seemed fundamentally divided were recognizing significant points of connection. The result heralded, if not a merger, perhaps an alliance in which diverse types of readers and viewers could appreciate how their differences enrich their engagement with Austin. Still, no one was talking very much about Austin and sex. The time was ripe, we decided, to write our own book. We wanted to consider the novels themselves, but we also wanted to cast a wide net that would capture the erotic energy pervading popular culture through film and stage, in fan fiction and online. The scope, however, caused us some discomfort. Although we were trained to analyze fiction, film, and popular culture, we were not comfortable speaking for either creators or fans. To do so would be to reinforce the division between scholarly and non-academic arenas that bothered us in the first place and limited discussions of Austin and sex. To take this work seriously, we needed to include perspectives that weren't our own. We realized that the book should be a collection rather than a monograph a conversation among representatives from the communities the book would discuss. Driving the project was one primary question. Were those of us in and outside the academy really so different in the ways we responded to sex and romance in all things Austin? We decided we needed to devote sections of the book to the three major spheres in which we saw Austin's erotic energy circulating, in the novels, in Austin-inspired fiction, and in dramatizations and role-playing games. 
A fourth section would talk about discourse, the ways the various communities grapple with Austin romance and desire. Then we set out to find our contributors. Securing what became the first group of scholars was comparatively straightforward. We decided against a general call for submissions. Instead, we invited colleagues like Rachel Brownstein, Devaney Lozer, and Juliet Wells, whose work on Austin reception and popular culture was foundational to our own inquiry. Along with Laura Engel and Marilyn Frankus, they were popular speakers at JASNA AGMs. Those are the annual, well, you guys probably know, but the annual general meetings of the Jane Austen Society of North America. And Juliet and Marilyn held positions in the organization. We also asked colleagues with expertise in specific fields. We were fans of Marianne O'Farrell's work on the novels, and Elaine McGurr was a shoo-in when it came to the stage. We also initially secured a few other scholars whom, as we will later explain, we lost along the way. Finding non-academics was more challenging. Diana Birchall, a well-known writer of Austin-esque fiction and stage productions at JASNA AGMs, whom Nora already knew, graciously agreed to participate. She also offered to introduce us to other writers and encouraged us to attend our first JASNA AGM, where we hoped we could meet Austin enthusiasts interested in writing about their favorite author and sex. We boldly reached out to several celebrated authors of Austin-inspired fiction, as well as journalists who wrote on Austin fandom. Some declined with the understandable explanation that writers without academic salaries couldn't afford to work without compensation. A few provisionally accepted on the condition that publication would bring a paycheck. However, they dropped out when we ultimately landed with an academic press. We had more luck with people who made a living through other media. We were thrilled when game designer Judy Tyrer signed on to write about her online game, Ever Jane. And we could barely contain our excitement when Margaret Dunlap promised an essay revealing the story between the, behind the Lydia sex tape in the YouTube series, The Lizzie Bennet Diaries, for which she wrote and produced. At this point, we had enough contributors on board to write a proposal and start hawking the book. Because we wanted to appeal to a broad audience and to help our writers keep food on the table, we initially decided to shoot for a popular press. We were advised to get a literary agent and we were granted meetings with several. One of them who spent many unpaid hours on our proposal, which she loved, ultimately declined to represent us because as she said, she couldn't afford a passion project. We were then introduced to a very high profile literary agent who took us on because he could afford a passion project. He made us revise our proposal to make it more appealing to publishers chiefly concerned with marketability. Nevertheless, our revised proposal, which ran to about 70 pages, met with accolades and regrets. Essay collections don't sell was a common refrain. For some, we were simply too scholarly. This process took up several years of our lives. I mean, at this point, we were really getting on there. We concluded that our ideal home would be an academic press after all, but we needed to find one that would truly understand and support our vision. Again, we were faced with the conundrum that had plagued us when we sought a popular press, except in reverse. Where could we find a publisher of scholarly books willing to take on a collection that was neither fish nor fowl? We turned to our friend Sonia Kane, the editorial director of University of Rochester Press, in the hope she could guide us. Instead, having read the proposal, she decided to speak to Rochester's board of directors and make a case for taking on the project themselves. The board, it turned, on, it turned out, needed persuasion, ideally in the form of a proposal that was not 70 pages long. So once again, we revised with a better result. Our first set of outside readers liked the lean and trim proposal, but they had some conditions. While we were considered too scholarly for a mainstream publisher, they didn't find us scholarly enough. We would have to fatten our proposal just a bit with a hardier critical framework. We were also told we had to change our original title, Doing Jane Austen, as well as other double entendres that we thought were clever, but they considered crass. So we went back to the drawing board one last time to include the scholarly apparatus we had dropped for our agent. Although we shed a few tears along the way, we agreed to change the title and indeed did so several more times before the book finally saw print. 
We also eliminated some, though not all, of the risque illusions we loved. This time it worked. The second set of readers' reports were ecstatic, and we were on our way. <laughs> and once again, all this took time. Along the way, we lost a few of our original contributors. This loss was an opportunity, however, to see what was missing from our original vision. We realized that in our quest for diversity of genres, we had overlooked other kinds of diversity that would enrich the book. Our discussion would benefit greatly from including queer readings, for example, as well as global perspectives. We also needed a few more non-academics, so we did research. A colleague recommended a former graduate student, Jade Higa, working on queer readings of Austin, who had decided to teach high school in Hawaii. We also discovered Christian Garcia, a scholar of visual culture and gender and sexuality studies who was training to be a psychotherapist through his brilliant reading of the erotic and persuasion. We had the good fortune of hearing Maria Claire Picado Biajoli, a scholar from Brazil, speak on Austin-esque fiction at Jasna AGM so we invited her as well. Finally, we were fortunate that Diana Birchall could introduce us to the author of the delightful Camp Austin, my life as an accidental Jane Austen superfan. Ted Scheinman, currently an editor at Smithsonian Magazine, and his mother, the scholar Deborah Nuth Clank, subsequently signed on to write, to write a jointly authored piece. Members of Jane Austen societies in other parts of the globe were also invited and were involved for a time, but unfortunately, COVID derailed them. Over the following year and a half, the manuscript came together. As it developed, the benefits of including a variety of voices and perspectives became readily apparent. In section two, for example, on Austen fan culture and Austen S fiction, Birchall's autobiographical piece on writing the complete Mrs. Elton illuminates scholarly work on fan fiction and fan culture by Frankis and Biagioli. Likewise, in section three, on Austin on stage, on screen, and online, Nora's essay on the 1995 Pride and Prejudice and Brownstein's on Sanda and Emma, Sanditon and Emma dwell companionably alongside Dunlap's discussion of the Lizzie Bennet diaries and Tyra's description of Ever Jane. Each section of the volume, each section of the volume also includes essays that challenge assumptions about content and style. The essays in section one on Austen's novels, though all written by authors with academic training, are remarkably different. O'Farrell's piece on teasing in Austen is written in a style that mimics its subject. Garcia's essay on fisting and sense and sensibility grounds his argument in queer theory in order to stretch his readers' imaginations. His essay is usefully read alongside Higa's, which probes narrative rather than anatomical fissures in a study of the search for queer comfort in Mansfield Park. Several sections also include essays by academics who decided to experiment with style and genre. In section two, Stephanie Wax's autobiography, sorry, I wanna pause again. <clears throat> I got through that last paragraph without laughing. Okay, several sections also include academics, essays by academics who decided to experiment with style and genre. In section two, Stephanie waxes autobiographical, claiming her identity as a scholar fan in her quest to catch Frank Churchill in the act, if not in Emma, then in Emma-inspired fan fiction, a search that leaves her unsatisfied. Elaine McGurr's piece bridges academic and non-academic essays in section three, interweaving memoir with scenes from her play, a pastiche of Austin's Mansfield Park and Elizabeth Inchbald's Lover's Baths. Perhaps we, because we are literary scholars, we initially imagined that section four would focus primarily on the different styles in which different groups write. Instead, it ended up demonstrating that the printed word is only one of many modes by which desire is communicated in and around Austin. If Lozer's chapter on erotica inspired by Austin proves anything, it is that language and images are closely entwined. Engel's essay, which to be honest, we can't seem to perfectly describe, is a meditation on screens in Austin and silhouettes by the painter Jane Beatham Reed and how these images evoke shadows of their real life romantic liaisons. Scheinman and Clank interweave close readings with personal experience in a narrative dance that illustrates the erotic language of dance in Austen's novels and in the spaces where Austen fans mingle. 
Our final surprise was when Juliet Wells, who had agreed to write the afterword for the collection, produced the most far ranging and inclusive work of literary criticism in the book. Not only did she discuss every one of the essays that we have just mentioned, but she put them in dialogue with Uzma Jalaluddin's Pride and Prejudice inspired coming of age novel, Aisha at Last. Before we conclude today's talk, we also want to say something about what we learned through this process of many years about the importance of collaboration. That is our scholarly and collaboration with one another. In the sometimes isolating world of research, writing and career building, we discovered how productive and invigorating it was to work with a partner, especially someone who shares the same obsessions. Over the years, we laughed, we cried, we yelled at one another. Before the pandemic, we used to work together in my Midtown office, mostly during the breaks between semesters. We would sit side by side, each on her own computer, talking through whatever was on our individual screens. Sometimes one of us would actually ride shotgun as we wrote on a single computer screen, periodically knocking one another's fingers off the keyboard. This is when the yelling typically occurred. Somehow we always needed to re re-eat, sorry, re-eat, re re-caffeinate, and use the restroom at exactly the same times. Our partnership took on new urgency during the COVID pandemic. At this time, as all of us know, we were suddenly isolated in our own homes, behind our own screens. Throughout these years, the logistics of our collaboration inevitably changed. Now we were talking, editing, and writing at our own desks in separate boroughs of New York City. Having this joint mission really helped motivate and sustain us intellectu intellectually and creatively. We were also told by some of our contributors that writing for our book was a lifeline at a time when it was hard to keep focus and direction. You would think that this book would have provided enough togetherness for the two of us, but apparently that was not the case. While we were in the throes of producing the final manuscript, Nora was nearing the deadline for an article on Lady Susan and Whit Stillman's love and friendship that she had promised to write for the collection Austin After 200 New Reading Spaces. Late one night, she had the brilliant idea of forcing me to write it with her. In fact, she held me hostage. This really happened by announcing <laughs> she would not complete the introduction to Jane Austen's sex and romance until the Lady Susan article was done. So I had better get on board. And thus, another collaborative piece of writing was born. Working with a writing pa pro partner is always a process of negotiation. Perhaps because we all also adhere to a feminist perspective, who leads and who follows is a question of which we were always aware and about which we occasionally battle. Stephanie and I have dissimilar personalities. I had to learn to shut up and listen. Stephanie has, ha has learned to shout me down. Along the way, we have developed an appreciation for each other's strengths and challenges as writers. I'm thesis driven and I love big ideas. Stephanie has the uncanny ability to recognize subtleties and make connections that often elude me. I believe in transitions. She likes commas, too much in my opinion. Perhaps the biggest difference is this. A long time ago, a colleague explained to me that some writers are grinders who need to write perfect sentences and entire paragraphs before moving on to the next. Others swoop, linking ideas with ellipses and coming together to move things around and fill in the blanks. To my dismay, I'm a grinder, while Stephanie swoops. This used to occasion frequent battles at the keyboard as I paused to find just the right word and refine my ideas, and Stephanie groaned with impatience to shoot forward. Now, however, each of us not only relies on each other's approach as a balance for our own writerly impulses, we even occasionally become one another. You're being me, we remarked as we were writing this talk and swapping roles. Another important collaboration is the kind we experience with the writers and editors who worked on this book. Their contributions made this volume into something beyond what we could have imagined. We hope that it will foster more conversations and lead to more alliances among diverse readers of Austin, especially on the always fascinating topic of Austin and sex. For us, it has already done so. Before we conclude, we will illustrate with two examples. Two years ago, we received an email from the journalist Luke Winkie, whom you may know from his opinion pieces for the New York Times. 
He was writing an article for Mel, a self-described guy culture online magazine that reports on, among other things, men's sex style and sex. The article was about the TV series Bridgerton and why it was such an aphrodisiac to viewers. You can look it up. It's entitled, Maybe It's Sex Therapy, Maybe They Just Watched Bridgerton. Winky wanted to know why Austin and Austin-inspired dramas like Bridgerton were such a turn-on for audiences. We figured he must have done a Google search for Austin and sex and found an article we had written called Sex Love in Austin, Was It Good for You in Persuasions Online, which is based on a talk we gave at a Jasna AGM while we were working on the book. Our interview with Winky was among the highlights of our respective careers. We had been recognized by the larger world as experts on the topic of Austin and sex, sexperts, and invited to shed light on this phenomenon for TV fans and readers of digital media. We had crossed over. A second more recent crossover experience happened this past Saturday after we attended a scholarly talk hosted by Jasna New York. While speaking with members of the planning committee about our own talk on Jane Austen's sex and romance, which is scheduled for sometime this spring, we noticed that one of them was holding our book. It turned out that two of them had already read it. They noted that the essays had made them interested in reading fan fiction something they had previously dismissed. They also expressed their desire to reach out to students studying Austin and to engage more scholars, not only as speakers, but as members as well. We were thrilled by their enthusiasm for the book and by their collaborative spirit. We believe it is a good sign for the future of Austin studies. Thank you for your time and your attention. And thank you. And thank you for your exemplary timekeeping. Uh, we have time out. Oh, we've got claps coming. Um, the nice kind, not the, the double entendre kind. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to pro probe things, I can make a clap. <laughs> uh, uh, but while we, we take this moment to celebrate our, our lovely speakers and start also pondering questions, because we have plenty of time for uh, a question. And while, while that's going, I'll just say that absolutely writing this, my chapter during the lockdown wasn't just therapeutic, but it also really helped me think about the topic that I was writing about and that kind of ability to look back in time, because it did take a long time to, for this project to come to fruition, but it, it gave me a chance to reflect um, and, and to see the connections between where I was then and, and where I am now and where Jane Austen was then and where we all are now. And it was just, it really was a fantastic opportunity to do that while bubbled, you know, and stuck at home. So thank you for that. And yes, doing JA was, uh, doing Jane Austen was a great title. And it wasn't- uh, We fought for it. <laughs> wasn't it making sex for a while? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which I also loved. Okay, uh, so if you can, I'm going to switch view so I can hopefully see everyone. If you can raise your hand or throw a question into the chat so I can call upon you. I think the elephant in the room uh, when talking about collaboration and scholarship is about it counting. Uh, and I know that when I've co-edited, I've worked with the, the fabulous Louise Engel, who is here, uh, which is one of the greatest experiences of my academic life. Um, and it was really lucky that we're working in different countries because it allowed us to both count the work that we're doing, whereas it, it can, that can sometimes sometimes be be a struggle for who gets credit. Um, I remember being in a conference with someone explained that they divvied up, they had you know, 12 contributors and so they're all each given like 12% credit for their project. And in cultures where we need to always quantify our productivity, that is a risk. Uh, so I guess I'd like to invite you guys to, to kind of talk a bit more about how the benefits, which I completely believe outweigh that risk of the kind of bean counting of, of academic productivity. That, does that make sense? Or is that not a problem for people not in the English system? No, it's still a problem. Um, it's still a problem. I think 
partly uh, one, well, one thing that happened with the Genesis, this particular book is it, had, I mean, going back, we thought it was 20 years, but it's really closer to 30 that, you know, from, from start to finish, that when we were starting, the idea of sort of working together was sort of, you know, protective. We were babies. And by the end, honestly, um, we wanted to do it despite the bean counting. You know, we felt so strongly about it. Um, and then I should also add, you know, Steffi's not lying that I, when she says I took her hostage, I really took her hostage. Um, lately in my career, I've found that collaborative, I work so much better when I'm collaborating. I'm smarter, I'm more productive, I have more fun doing it. Um, so to a certain extent, the benefits really for me outweigh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll have more beans, even if I'm a co-author, if I'm writing with someone, that if I'm writing on my own, and there'll be better beans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it really helps also with the problem of procrastination, because when you have, you know, um, you give one another deadlines and have meeting times, it's, it's much uh, harder to put off the inevitable sitting down to write. And, um, you know, what we described before about actually sitting in the office for hours and hours together, um, you know, sometimes we would say, well, this, maybe this is a little bit crazy. We do, do we really need to be in the same room? But somehow being on the schedule together, it really made us work in ways that, you know, I, I feel like I definitely accomplished more um, than I could have accomplished on my own. Thank you. I'm not, I'm better beans for all is a, a slogan we can we can get behind. Uh, can I throw it to the floor? Are there any questions that I'm missing? Hands should jump to the top of my screen. Or comments. We have some of our contributors here too. Hi everyone. Hey Laura. <laughs> hey, Laura. Uh, congratulations, you guys. This is so exciting and and thank you. Uh, for including me and my very strange essay on silhouettes, which I loved writing. Um, I have a question. I have just been teaching lots of Austin, um, and I've been really struck by the ways in which my students are thinking about the interwoven threads of popular culture in Austin, most specifically the phenomenon of Colleen Hoover, whose books I've never read, but in fact, all of my students have read her books, uh, and uh, Taylor Swift, whose tickets are now on sale for $600 to $800, like a seat. Um, I got three projects on the relationship between Taylor Swift and Jane Austen with like Spotify lists with different songs and different characters and different novels. Um, and two projects on the relationship between calling the romance and desire and calling Hilbert's novels and different characters in Austen. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about this sort of fascination um, and the ways in which these kind of contemporary, I, I guess, icons of female public productivity um, have are influencing ways of thinking about Austin in a new generation. Steph, you want to chime in or should I go? You can go. Okay, well, I'm teaching an Austin seminar right now and Colleen Hoover and Taylor Swift are all over the place. Um, and I haven't read Colleen Hoover. Um, so it's, it's been really, it's been kind of interesting because I mean, what I'm teaching right now is I'm teaching um, I'm teaching an Austin seminar, and I'm also teaching an Austin Austin in a film adaptation course, and I find it's really interesting to um, to see the way both groups of students, in a way, really want to talk about or access the material through adaptations and through you know through popular culture. Um, All right, I'm just going to be honest. And part of me, despite the fact that we put together this book, like really battles with that. You know, I want them to look at Austin's language and I want them to be grounded in the culture and the history. And so 
I'm moving towards, I'm, I'm trying to get them there through the popular culture, but at the same time, I'm finding that what they're doing for me is sort of dragging me into an appreciation of Taylor Swift, which I've resisted for quite a long time. Um, so, you know, part of the process, I guess, that I'm having is understanding that I need to take this seriously. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. Yeah, I'd love to hear what other people have to say about this. Ellen says Taylor Swift is the muse of their generation. And I, I've certainly had quite a few Taylor Swift dissertations. So um, yeah, I think the Taylor Swift to Jane Austen works in both directions for this generation. Elka, can I call on you to ask your question? Hi. Um, yeah, it's kind of an addition, like a more comment, but just on the on the Taylor Swift being amused. Uh, as a former student of Professor Nishumi, um, and she helps me write my thesis on Jane Austen and adaptations. Um, and as someone who's going to the Taylor Swift concert um, in, you know, in New York. I really do see that it's all about it's all about connecting through the language. I think for me, Taylor Swift lyrics, I know this is a little off, but um, that it's it's not it's not just if you're listening to the music for the for the actual lyrics, then then you do find that you're connecting to stories that she that she's talking through stories. So I think that um, the way that that everyone can reach Austin through her stories is just very similar. So just because it's a different medium, um, I think that's exactly the point. Um, and I think that it's great that Professor Nishimi is connecting <laughs> to the lyrics because I think really, she really does tell a story and she does tell a romance the same way as Austin. I really think it's a great comparison. Oh, that's awesome. And I can say it's news to me. I've never listened to Taylor Swift. And just when you think, you know, just when you think as a scholar, you're expanding your horizons by learning about popular culture, you realize there's another a new frontier, right? You know, um, we, you know, we've seen the movies, we've watched the TV shows, we've watched Bridgerton, but uh, okay, now I have to listen to Taylor Swift because it's moving in, in that direction. So in a way, it's kind of like the, the research is endless. You know, th this is the sort of, you know, evergreen quality of Austin and sex and popular culture. It's ever expanding. So our, our work is never done. You know, except the thing I really, you know, there's this really important difference, which I think is just so important, which is so crucial, which is that Taylor Swift has so much agency, right? I mean, her she's she has financial agency. She's able to sort of tell autobiographical stories. And I think that that, you know, sort of, I want to push the conversation in a little bit of a, you know, um, oppositional direction, if that makes sense. And sort of say that while we're talking about all of this crossover and how generative it is, part of the question, part of our project is also, um, to know differences and distinctions, right? That if we're all the same, it's not an interesting conversation, right? That's why Stephanie and I work together because, you know, she hates my grinding. And so that was not, okay. So anyway, the, um, <laughs> stop laughing, Colleen. <laughs> anyway, so the point is that, you know, I think it's also really important, you know, to note just as Taylor Swift is empowered in a way that say Austin's heroines are not, right? Although, and Austin sort of had to get to sideways. Another distinction is, you know, when we were writing this book, we wanted to know whether academics and non-academics were talking about the same thing using different language or really talking about different things, right? And I think in the end, the answer is kind of both, right? That it's really important both to really appreciate Colleen Hoover, who I'm going to go read, and Taylor Swift, and at the same time, and with full respect, right? And at the same time, sort of also think about the different skills we all bring, 
to these conversations, right? I'm seeing more faces. Anybody want to chime in? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to jump in here because I am not a Taylor Swift expert, but I think she, at this point, at least based on my students, she's been around a while, like a long time, but I'm not so interested in Taylor Swift. I think we should be getting back to the sex here <laughs> be, because that, that was really the driving part of, of the book, at least based on my sense of it. And, and the desire issues in the book. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Austin's readers always knew about it because Austin's talking. I, we, we know what's going on with Lydia and Wickham. We know that they're having sex, right? We know what Mary Crawford's talking about. Um, and whether scholars are talking, what interested me is whether scholars were talking about it the way I'm not sure I like the binary of scholars and not scholars, because I think scholars really kind of are fans, whether they admit it or not. And the notion that scholars are objective, I don't think we're objective. <laughs> I think we commit to things, whether we, I, I mean, the very fact that we choose what we choose as subjects signals a kind of devotion. Um, and so the notion of maybe this is heresy. And I'm being recorded as a no, heritage. it's totally be it. not. But but you know we we commit to the subjects we do research on. So so um, even before Henry Jenkins said I'm an ACA fan, on some level I think as scholars we commit to our fields, right? That's so so, so I think Juliet's right that lots of people would only answer, you know, what does Jane Austen mean to you off the record? I think a lot of us would say, we love Jane Austen. Yeah, uh, well, absolutely. But I want to- like, I'm sorry, that was not- No, I think you're right. In fact, like I just sort of want to tie you with Margaret, whose box is right next to yours because- Hi, Margaret. She, <laughs> she was talking, I mean, her piece talks about sort of, you know, how to translate, you know, Lydia and Wickham to YouTube, right? To, to Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Which was awesome, by the way, and I teach that to my students, and I kept an image of the the image that you were not supposed to keep. But I do not print it out for my students, and I only show it to them. Wait, what was the image you were? I've, I I'm blank. Of the video. Oh, the, yeah. vi the video website. Oh yeah. I Martin, have it on my laptop, but I do not print it out for my students because Martin, I don't want can you, actors for, to be For people who haven't read the book, can you talk a little bit about the fan, like the response to the whole, because this is this whole really cool, like transmedia response to, to the Lydia sex tape issue on the Lizzie Bennet diaries that was crazy because, you know, they thought it was real. It, Thank you. And, and yeah, it was just, it was amazing. Um, when you first approached me to, uh, to write an essay for the book, it was like not long after we had done the show and I, you know, dashed off the proposal and then, you know, didn't hear anything for five years. And I'm like, well, you know, projects die. I'm in Hollywood. This happens all the time. And it's like, no, we still want you to write this thing. I'm like, crap, what did I say I was going to write about? And so years after the fact, I'm like, can you please send me my proposal that I sent to you? Because I have no idea what I was going to write. And then you sent it back and I still had no idea what I would have written five years earlier. But I think in a way the time was good because it was an excuse to go back and talk to the cast and to other members of the crew and the creative team and be like, so what was that like for you? And, you know, less sort of, you know, the oral history of the Lydia Bennett sex tape because... We were updating Pride and Prejudice as a YouTube video diary, effectively, that Lizzie is keeping as part of a graduate school project. And, uh, you know, as, as much as we tried to signal, yes, this is scripted, there's always the, like, who, who reads the full video description on a YouTube video? The answer, nobody. Um, and so you get, you know, delightful things. It's like, your life is a lot like this book by Jane Austen. And that was the one kind of comment that Lizzie in character could never respond to because the book did not exist in her world or it would have been weird. 
Um, but yeah, there was a lot of like the one of the first questions when we got in the room with the writers was like, what are we going to do about Lydia and Wickham eloping? Because as I said in the essay, like, well, clearly Gretna Green is going off to Vegas, but going off to Vegas to get married, you know, when you're 21 is like, it's a thing, but it's a reparable thing. It's not a life ruining thing. Running off to Vegas to not get married is even less of a thing. Um, and so trying to come up with something that carried appropriate social weight in the same way that that elopement would have for Austin's audience that our audience would intuitively understand and what we came up with was that Wickham had covertly made a sex tape of him and Lydia and was going to release it to uh to get a bunch of money in order to because you know Darcy wasn't paying up effectively and uh and Marilyn I'm so glad that you you kept the website it's I'm I suspect that what happened is in the years after production, you know, it's another $10 fee to keep the domain up and we don't have it. And, you know, somebody just stopped paying that as happens in independent productions. And then I had to access archive.org to find a screenshot to put into the book. Um, so, yeah, but it's a, uh, but yeah, but there was this sort of thing of like, we had a very suggestive photo and you're like, oh my God. And then also like, can, Wickham, you're a terrible person. Can I have, you know, I need to see this video when it comes out. And we're like, guys, we didn't actually make a sex tape between two of our actors. Like, no, it just, it was never going to be released because it was never there. But uh, but it really, it blurs the line um, between where you've suspended your disbelief and and where that trails off and i think there are very interesting ethical questions about that but that's a, uh, a more generalized topic but yeah thanks for having me but by, by the way margaret i was teaching austin in popular culture the semester the lizzie bennett diaries came out <laughs> and as an immersive experience my students were all in Oh, that is that is delightful. Oh, yeah, didn't they? Didn't Lydia's defenders actually try and crash the website? They it got floated as a theory a couple of times, and of like you know we we probably have the expertise to do a a denial of service attack on this website. Maybe we're supposed to do this, and we're like, crap! Please don't do this. It's going to kill our server bills. We we don't have that kind of money. Like, I think if we'd had to go to Hank Green and be like, um, we need a few thousand dollars to pay for all of this. And it might've been more than a few. So our transmedia producer, Jay Bushman, who fortunately had enough sort of, you know, presence in the fan community, people knew who he was, he had good relations and he had to, you know, step out behind the curtain and say, you've come to a very reasonable conclusion that is also wrong please don't do that. We'll, we'll take care of this, we promise. Um, and that fortunately, you know, if people who came up with that idea later would, it's like, we're supposed to save Lydia. And people are like, no, no, we've been told that we don't have to save Lydia. Just, you know, take a deep breath. It'll be fine. Um, I have to say, circling back a little bit to what we were talking about Taylor Swift earlier, not per se, but one of the most heartwarming comments that I would get, you know, either we'd see online or I'd run into people at VidCon, which is the YouTube convention or something like that, is people saying, it's like, I could never get into Jane Austen. Like my mom read Jane Austen. People told me I should read Jane Austen. I couldn't get into it until I saw the update. And once I knew the story, that helped them get through the language. Um, and then one time I was at VidCon, I'm like riding up an escalator with uh, Laura Spencer, the actress who played Jane, and a fan is like, uh, and she's like, are, are you Jane? And she's like, yeah. And it's like, it's just like, I love your series so much. I used it to teach my mother about YouTube. And I'm like, wonderful. We have literacy for the young and computer literacy for the old. We are truly, you know, bringing the generations together. And that just made my day. And a beautiful story that, that also floats perfectly with the opening conversation about the combining the scholarly and the non-scholarly and the passion project that unites us all. And I think passion is probably the byword. We all have a passion for Jane Austen and we have a 
you know, we all have our own academic passions. And I would love to see more work like this coming out in the future. I think it's been a fantastic journey. I've only been in it for about 10 years. I haven't been on the whole 30 year ride. But it has been, it has Definitely been. Has. <laughs> uh, I want to, to ask if there are any final words um, before I ask, tell you all to go off and have some mince pies and enjoy the festive season. Oh, well, enjoy your new boilers, enjoy some mince pies. Uh, have a lovely festive season and do please uh, subscribe to our Eventbrite page so that you never miss another talk. And uh, we've got a fantastic slate of speakers. Oh, oh, oh Nora's got some uh, a famous Steffi laugh. does actually. And maybe the and same thing. Um, I, did you post, we have a link for a discounted copy of our book. No, I forgot about that because I'm a terrible yeah. being. Yeah, you can get your copy, your beautiful pink book, um, Jane Austen, Sex and Romance. I think they're offering a 60%, a 40% discount. Um, so, and it's yeah. also there's an e copy that's quite affordable and make your library spend the money and get the other one, but it's it's a fun book <laughs> because of you guys. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Elaine. Sorry. Sorry, no, I'm just trying to find it now. There's so many emails from you. <laughs> we write a lot. We so, write a lot. Uh, no, it's my fault too. Okay. I think this is it. Here's the flyer. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, I need to. Sorry. I. Does it come in the chat? Yeah, I am working on getting it into the chat. Or Steffi, can you post it? Do you have it? Uh, um, uh, I got it. I got it. Got it. Who go. has the worst technical skills in the world? Me. <laughs> Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Uh, there have been some other things that come up came up in the, the chat about the kind of global interest in this book, but I think we can take those offline because uh, our hour is officially up. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And I look for, forward to seeing you in the new year. If you do, cannot download from, uh, I put that in the wrong place. Okay, if you cannot download the, uh, oh, there, way down the, oh, here, two places. Um, which is great. You can also email me and I will send it to you or, or just contact Nora or Steffi directly. Well, thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. It's lovely to see so many lovely faces. Thank you all for coming out today. <sighs> Sorry about that, guys. Right. Um, so you did have, oh, Stephanie, I will, Nora's gone. I'll send you a detail. There's, I said I'd pass on some information about possibly getting Jane Austen's Sex and Romance translated into oh. French and Spanish. There's been some interest in that. So I'm, I will just connect you to um, that editor directly so you guys can, I don't know how that works through Boydell and Brewer or Rochester. I don't want to try to speak for the any of the presses. Okay, well, fantastic. That would be great. Um, our our last participant here is, is a representative of the press, but I'll, I'll just link you guys up directly offline. I think if you just talk to each other directly, it'll be easier. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care, Stephanie. It's really nice to see you. See you.